good evening, everyone. Grab your hymn books. Hymn number 18. Let's all stand. We'll sing Take the Name of Jesus with you. Hymn number 18. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then wherever you go. second verse. Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, Thomas. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be here tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll get things started. Brother Denny, if you would, sir, please lead us in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for being in your house, Lord, and learn more about you. And we just uh, pray, Lord, for the service tonight, Lord, you bless the Lord, and, and uh, just pray we'll learn from it and uh, be able to apply it to the world. Father, I pray for this. And I just pray all these things, Lord, in uh, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Please be seated. Nice to have you all here this evening. There's still a couple families away on vacation, that last vacation before school starts. And looking forward to uh, this uh, year coming up. We have a couple uh, Bible Institute classes over at Lehigh Valley Baptist Church that I'll be doing. I'm looking forward to that. But uh, other than that, it's just going to be a wonderful start for the fall, especially with Brother Doug Hammett coming in uh, from Lehigh Valley Baptist Church. And, of course, he'll be coming back from South Africa and spending about a month a little over a month in the States, visiting family and coming, uh, has a couple meetings and one of them is ours. So I'm looking forward to that in September and I hope that you'll, excuse me, in October and I hope that you'll plan on being here for all the services. Um, tonight, if you have the opportunity, we need a hand, especially some of you fellas, um, the last of our vacation Bible school decorations needs to come down. The, the horses need to leave the stable and be put out to pasture. And so uh, we're going to disassemble that. Tom, you brought, I brought my drill. You got your real drill. Yeah. And so uh, uh, with star bits, of course. I actually brought a Phillips. You brought a Phillips bit? I, I actually have a star bit. Wow. Yeah, I know. This is, this is really role reversal for us. And so uh, we'll need to, to, to disassemble that uh, stall out there for our vacation Bible school. I think it's a monster. It was well constructed, and I'm not sure who the engineer was, but uh, probably, it was probably over engineered. Uh, but um, we, we'll need to take that apart and get it uh, downstairs uh, eventually to go into storage. So if you can help out with that after the services, be greatly appreciated as we disassemble that and also getting that horse out from behind the visitors. Uh, Senator, there. So uh, please uh, lend his hand. All right. I'd appreciate that. I, um, I was asking Tom uh, last week, of course, we were out of town. So it was the last Sunday of the month and we didn't do birthdays and anniversaries. Uh, and somebody reminded me that we didn't even do July birthdays and anniversaries because we had our corn boil. And so we're really getting behind. And so um, let, let's let's do some singing tonight. So if you had a birthday in July, we need you to come for it. July birthdays. July birthdays. I see, I see poking going on. Is there poking going on? 
There's a, oh, there we go. A couple ladies. Danny, there we go. Damaris, did you have a birthday? How old are you nowadays? Eight? Seriously? Man, you're a lot younger than Brother Dennis, who is a lot older than eight. And uh, that's, this is July. And so August also, I had a birthday in August, so I'm going to have to jump down here. Who else's uh, birthday? Yeah, yeah. ta-da, August. Sister Gertrude, August birthday? August 20th. Oh, awesome. I was the fourth. And any other August, August birthdays? Tom, you're going to have to lead this because I can't lead my own happy birthday song. That would be weird. So I'm just going to stand here and just behave myself. Okay, here we go. everyone. Wonderful. Happy birthday. Anniversaries in the month of July and August. There we go. We have some birthdays, uh, anniversaries. How many years is it for you, young couple here? Eight, Eight years. Eight. Brother, Brother Dennis? Four. Oh, man. You guys are just kids. Mrs. Waite, how many years is this? Did you leave your husband at the nursing home? Did he just kind of fit? I, I'm, it's, they were at the nursing home ministry today. All right? I'm not saying anything about age here. He's sleeping at the nursing home. Okay. He's working. He does work at a nursing home, too. So uh, you left your husband at the nursing home. I like that. I'm going to use that line in the future. So, amen. Oh, yeah. So how many years have you and your husband been married? 31. Oh, man. Just kids. All righty. Any other anniversaries? In this month, all right. Did you lose your dad? Yeah, he, my dad, and my mom up here. Oh, yo, somebody get Buzz. He's probably locked himself in the. Uh, the oh man, yeah. <laughs> Joy, come on up here. Yeah, yeah, I got to, I got to do your wedding too. So, did this young couple? Too. Yeah, yeah. Hey guys. 21? 21 years, yeah. Man, I was just, it was just like yesterday. Yeah. All righty. Uh, any others? I'm only half, so it's... Those are oh, that's right. Your dear wife is at home with sick kids. Singular. Sick kid. Yeah. All right. Come on over and stand. Yeah. We're gonna, Clearly it's fun. I mean, come on if we're going to embarrass you. At least we could do that. So, uh, so how many years for you and your dear wife? You think it's you think it's seventeen, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Eighteen, seventeen, seventeen, yeah, that sounds about oh, right. Seventeen. Yeah. 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 Just kids. Man, all right. Maestro. Here we go. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Beautiful. All right. Memory verse. We have a memory verse. This is a brand new memory verse for the month of September. And so, Brother Stephen, if you would please. <coughs> it is September, right? It is. Okay. All right. It's all yours, man. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 1. Just one verse. Get a break this month. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 1. If you go there with me real quick. Philippians 4, 1. And if you're there, if you read that nice and loud with me, it says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. All right, not too bad. Yeah. All right, there it is. Uh, enjoying working on that together with you guys. Tom? Okay, grab your hymn books. Hymn 29, At the Cross. Let's all stand. We'll sing At the Cross, hymn number 29. Alas, indeed, my Savior bleed. 
and in my sovereign time would he devote that sacred hand for such a worm as I at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy on the day. Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the all that last verse a drop repay the debt of love I Self away, tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the Amen. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you, Hannah Joy. All righty. I invite you, please, take your Bibles and join me over in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, over the last uh, several weeks, we have been going through this portion of Scripture, talking about these uh, characteristics um, of those in the end times. And, of course, uh, making sure that we understand that God expects some different characteristics from us in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And um, I'm gonna, uh, we're all the way down to verse number 4, but I'm going to start at the, at the beginning there in verse number 1 and read down through there. Uh, but the Bible says this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning of verse number 1, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be, and here's the list of those characteristics, lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. I pray that you would bless now as we spend some time uh, speaking about uh, this uh, characteristic of high-mindedness. And Lord, that you would help us to understand uh, that um, we uh, have an opportunity as, as your children to live a life that is different than uh, what we see in this world today. And Father, that we would shine as lights in darkness and that we would show the world that there is hope in Jesus Christ and there is a transformation that takes place in our lives because of our relationship with you. And now, Father, I pray you'd bless in the teaching and preaching of your word this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Tonight, we're going to be talking about being high-minded. It's not a word that you'll see a lot in the scriptures. As a matter of fact, it's not a word that I would generally use in my vocabulary. It's not something that I would say very often. And as we've been doing it these last uh, several weeks, um, trying to get a youngin up here to hold up. Man, I've seen these arms, these hands shooting up really fast. Anderson, I know your hand went up so quick. So come on up here, man. You, got, you get to hold this, all right? You, you don't have any bugs on you, do you? Okay, just kind of make sure. All right, stand right up top here. Not that he has bugs on his body, but he does have pet bugs. You all know that, right? Yeah. And I've seen... They're uh, in this building right now. They're in the building? Yeah. There's a bug in the building? Yeah. Just one or multiple? One. One. Well, one live one. One live... Oh, okay. 
wow, this sounds really scary. All right. So um, what we see here, what uh, Anderson has here is the word that's translated high-minded. And uh, do you know what that says? Can you, can you pronounce that? Um, see, I wrote it on the back for you. You did? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty close, okay? So, the, so yeah, this, this letter here is the pH, that's a pH sound, toof. And, and this is like a oo sound, and that's an o sound, so it's oo Toof oo Can you say that? Oo-o. Yeah, there you go, just like that. And uh, that's the word that's translated high-minded in our scriptures. It's a very interesting word. Um, the, um, the root of that word is that, and that's uh, the, the root word for that is, is tufo, and that's the word in the Bible for smoke. So, so this word, it's translated high-mindedness. It, you think about it this way, like blowing smoke. That's exactly what we're talking about. And uh, so some, it's kind of an idiom. Sometimes we would say that you're just kind of blowing smoke. Um, so what we're, what we're talking about is, 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 is related to being proud, but it's more than just being proud. <clears throat> it's the result or the action of someone with a proudful heart. So somebody who is filled with pride will be high-minded. That's, how, that's the connection. Okay, And so there is a direct connection between being proud and being high-minded. And, and so, um, um, as a matter of fact, the Bible would say things like this. Uh, and I'm reading from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 6. We're talking about characteristics of, of pastors and, and such as that. And, and it's, it says specifically that, a, that somebody who is a candidate being chosen uh, to be a pastor in a church before they're ordained, that they are not a novice, lest they be lifted up with pride and he fall into the condemnation of the devil. And so being lifted up with pride, that's this idea of being high-minded. So there's this kind of elevation. You get the idea with the smoke, if you would, in that sense. And so, um, so uh, th- this idea of being proud is something that often is not just limited to unbelievers, okay? Uh, because, you know, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 6, that verse I just read is talking about uh, people that are, uh, are being considered for the ministry. So we're talking about believers too. So that characteristic of being high-minded is not just something that's limited to unbelievers because Christians can be high-minded if we're not careful. It's a, it's a prideful attitude that's expressed um, in some way, shape, or form. Um, Let's see, uh, and I'm reading from, uh, this is from uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 3 uh, through 5, and it says, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, the Bible says he is proud, knowing nothing. And so somebody who refuses to listen to good doctrine is considered to be proud and, and act in a high-minded way. Uh, doting about questions and strife of words, um, talking about envy and strife and railing. So somebody who's high-minded, somebody who's proud and acts out on that, often has a hard time getting along with other people. Now, just think about that a second. So we think about being high-minded. Um, because somebody who's high-minded, they, they, they're always elevating themselves. And in order to elevate yourself, you've got to put other people down. And so, of course, there's going to be a lot of contention. So let's just talk. I mean, people, we're talking about being high-minded. It's that, you know, blowing smoke. Um, you're, what you're doing is you are speaking about things that are not necessarily true. You're always elevating yourself. You're always putting yourself above other people. Um, so, like, for instance, um, what's that? Bragging is a good way of expressing that, but you're, it's all, it's, you know, it's all about me. Let's, I mean, let's just say, I, I, I know some of you young people, um, you know, involved in, let's just say, let's just pick a sport. I don't know, any sport. Ho- somebody said hockey. All right, Charlie says hockey. All right, let's just pick a sport like hockey. So, you know, like, like Dave, Dave would say, you know, I, oh, I, I, he's a goalie. And how, how often do goalies score goals, Dave? Oh, you see, okay, now, see, we're going in the right direction now, all right? 
So, so let's just say Dave is thinking, well, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a goalie and I scored a, I scored a goal the other day. Uh, you know, just an amazing thing. It was, you know, somebody had a slap shot and he kicks it off and he hit it so hard it went all the way down the ice. Boom! Scores. The team goes wild. And so, so Dave is sharing that after church services one night. And, and you know, somebody, somebody's out in the foyer and, uh, and, you know, and they're sitting there going, oh, that's nothing. Uh, yeah, I'm a goalie. I, 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 I score goals all the time. And, and so what you, what you have is this idea of, pro, of, you know, pride and arrogance, of always elevating yourself above other people. And, and it's you kind of easy to picture and imagine, you know, in a, in a situation like that where you just have a bunch of teens kind of, you know, shooting off their mouth at one another. But, you know, high-mindedness is more than just bragging about your abilities. Um, it, it is, it is uh, it, it, you know, you add to that this, this um, desire of being recognized, of, of wanting to make sure that, that, you know, you're the center of attention. So high-mindedness is this, this thought of, of yourself being superior to everyone else. So, you know, I'm always right, you're never wrong, right? I'm, I'm never, I'm always right, you're always wrong. Um, what, I just read this the other day. Those, those of you that think you're always right are irritating to us who are. I, I just read that the other day, and I, I, I thought, man, what a, what a great quote that is, you know? Um, and so it's a, it's a really high-minded type of attitude. So high-mindedness, how do you say that again? Yeah, very good. You're getting really good at that, man. And so high-mindedness is this, is this practice of always elevating yourself. It will always cause strife, envy. Uh, um, it, it will cause, as the scripture says, perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds. Okay? So it always, it always um, just brings about this contention with other people. Uh, and so, so this idea of blowing smoke... Um, and, and uh, presenting yourself as being something that's superior. Now, um, being proud uh, is always wanting attention to an individual. Um, I do want to remind you that the Bible says that, that God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. And so high-mindedness, what it does is it robs us really of the grace of God, God's desire to extend his favor towards us and, um, and so when we have a proud uh, heart and, and it plays out in high-mindedness, always elevating ourselves, we really do ourselves a disservice because we are being robbed of God's desire of really blessing our lives. And why would he extend his grace towards us and his blessings uh, when, we, uh, when we are just going to take that and always focus it upon ourselves. Um, you know, this, 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 you know, talking about ourselves um, becomes um, empty bragging. You're always misleading others concerning truth, especially when it comes to yourself. Uh, always elevating yourself above every everyone else. You know, um, um, I was just looking up some other definitions of the word high-mindedness just by uh, in dictionaries. It talks about a lofty way of thinking about oneself. Um, considering your, yourself a superior to, to all others. Um, you know, when, when you think about high-mindedness, um, somebody who's high-minded is always thinking they're better than everyone else. They're smarter, they're prettier, they're better skilled, they're holier, they are richer. Um, in, in every way, shape, or form, they are superior in, in, uh, in everything. And, uh, you know, I know over the years I've met folks that are like that, um, they're not very pleasant to be around. <laughs> um, they're the kind of folks you really don't want to, you, you try to avoid having conversation with because you know every time you open your mouth and start talking about something, they're always going to direct the conversation to themselves uh, because uh, that's all they think about. High-minded. They're always thinking about themselves and how superior they are in everything. Um, I, I always call that one-upmanship. That's a term that I heard many years ago that works out really well. So anytime you talk about anything, they've always got something a little bit better to say uh, about that. And, uh, you know, Dennis can say, I caught a fish this big. And somebody who is, who is high-minded says, well, that's nothing. <laughs> 
and uh, they, because their fish is always bigger, right? And uh, and their kids are always smarter, and their cars are always faster, and uh, um, you know their bank account is always bigger, and that's somebody who's high-minded. There is absolutely nothing um, that they could find that they couldn't say that they were superior to. High-mindedness. Uh, I would invite you to take your Bibles and go over with me to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. The word high-minded is found a couple places in the Scripture. Um, the, the, the term that, uh, what's that word you got there, Anderson? Okay, uh, that is, that's uh, found very limited amount of times in the Scripture, but the word high-mindedness is found in other places in Scripture. And as I said, there's a direct link between high-mindedness and pride. And so most of the time you see the word high-minded in the Scriptures, it, it comes from uh, the word that has to do with being proud. And so there is this connection. But I do want to point out a couple of the uh, Scriptures here that talk about high-mindedness. Um, the one here is... Um, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and um, um, hey, Dina, would you read that for me, 1 Timothy 6, uh, verse number 17? 1 Timothy 6, 17. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. All right, now this is, again, this is directed towards believers because the context here is, as Paul is writing, uh, he's writing to Timothy about folks that are in, in, um, in Timothy's ministry. And Timothy, of course, was there in Ephesus. Ephesus was a major city, uh, metropolitan area. Um, so you're going to find in this major city uh, folks that have made a lot of money. Um, particularly it was a seaport, so there's a lot of ways to make money in a major city like this in the Roman Empire. And so folks are getting saved, and some of those folks are, are you know, financially doing really well. And so, um, you know, Paul is reminding Timothy, you need to talk to these folks, because riches, being wealthy has a tendency of, of um, producing high-mindedness. So, um, you know, money does corrupt in a lot of different ways, and sometimes it corrupts in our thinking. So, um, you know, you think, uh, somebody who's thinking that they're really well off financially, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. God must be blessing me. Is, is there always a correlation between God's blessing and wealth? Well, I mean, certainly you see people like Abraham, who God really blessed financially. And, but we see in the New Testament, God extending these great warnings concerning wealth. Um, because this portion of Scripture we're talking about, there's this re warning that, that, that godliness is not necessarily found in, in gain. And, and, uh, and so there are a lot of people that end up um, allowing the riches to indicate to them that God must be blessing them when really the riches are going to be their destruction. And he talks about this introduction of high-mindedness into people that are, that are wealthy because they get to thinking more of themselves and less of others. They begin to think more of their prosperity as a result of their own, maybe their cleverness, uh, or their, uh, you know, their ability of handling their, their finances, and, and less about the fact that, you know, you know God, um, if there's anything that's been good in my life, it's not because I am able to, you know, handle my business better, or I'm just, you know, God must be, God must be blessing me because I'm, I'm, I'm better, or I'm holier, or I'm, I deserve it more than anyone else. High-mindedness is often, we see it connected here to wealth because wealth does have a tendency of kind of, um, of changing the way we think about ourselves. We have to be careful, um, especially when we end up having, um, uh, and I'm not saying we have to be rich in order to, to think that we're wealthy. You know, folks have a couple extra dollars at the end of the week, and they think, uh, they think very highly of themselves. Not to trust in uncertain riches. When high-mindedness comes in, the lack of trust in God uh, is, uh, is uh, switched 
to a trust in self. Self-ability, we're absorbed in our own, um, our, our own thoughts about uh, our, our financial stability. Um, th- as the Bible says, um, and, and referring to riches, that they are, they are uncertain riches. And prosperity is never guaranteed. Um, it's just an amazing thing when you uh, see, especially in the economy that we've had over the last couple of years, how quickly uh, folks' fortunes can be lost. And it amazes me sometimes that folks still, even with that uncertainty that we've seen over the last couple of years, still uh, look, towards, um, uh, look towards the monetary portion of our society and think that's where they're going to find uh, happiness and stability and forget about the fact that God is the one who actually gives us uh, peace and comfort and joy. High-mindedness is associated with, uh, with wealth, uh, if, and if we're not careful, it can take any one of us. Another time that high-mindedness is used in the scriptures in reference to um, uh, um, a spiritual superiority and you're going to find that over in Romans chapter 11 if you turn over there. Now this is a, in Romans chapter 11, it's a general statement in reference to Jews and Gentiles. Okay, so this is not a very, spe- this is not specific as an individuals, but God dealing with the nation of Israel and then God dealing with the Gentiles. Uh, and so, but Paul uses that term high-mindedness in reference to that. And you'll see that over in Romans chapter 11. And um, Dina, can I put you to work again? Uh, chapter 11, can you look at verse number 19 and just start reading down from there? 11, 19. Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's just stop right there. And he's making statements concerning the, the nation of Israel and how God stopped dealing with the nation of Israel. Branches were broken off and grafted in was the Gentile nations. God began to deal with the Gentiles. And, and he uses the term high-mindedness in reference to <coughs> excuse me, in reference to the Gentiles who all, who are now looking down on the Jews thinking, "Oh man, uh, you you guys you guys are out of sorts. Or you're out of sorts with God, and uh, and look at look at us now, as if we're you know some we're superior in some way, shape, and form. You know, um, thinking of ourselves as spiritually superior to others is a dangerous thing, and that's what Paul is saying. And this, these are general terms in reference to Jews and Gentiles. But I just want to think of uh, just kind of make an application in, in this sense. You know, um, I, I do believe that we preach the Word of God. Um, we're an independent Baptist church, and we, ha- we, uh, we preach the truth. Uh, we're not the only ones that preach the truth, but the proof that we preach is the only way. And um, that doesn't make us superior to others. Um, and I know we were talking about apostasy this morning and heresy and those type of things over the last couple of weeks in Sunday school. And, you know, I'm not saying it's an acceptance of, of you know, for churches that don't take, preach the truth. But if we, ha- if, if we look at ourselves and say, listen, we have the truth and think that we're superior because of that, then we put ourselves in great danger. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you have been exposed to the truth of God and you've accepted that truth and, and embraced that truth, then... That, that is not a commentary on how smart you are or how spiritual you are. Um, you know, it's a, it's a commentary on the grace of God. That he, he, has, he has extended to you the opportunity of hearing and responding to the truth of his word. Um, in, in a sense, it's, it's, it should be humbling and, and not elevating. You know, being exposed to truth is a great thing. And, and throughout the scriptures, you see many people as God has dealt with them and given them truth. What you see is extremely humbling positions. You see men like Isaiah, uh, who, you know, he saw God high and lifted up. And God commissioned him and gave him this great calling. And it, and it broke him. 
He saw himself as, as undone, as, as unclean. Uh, you see others who God dealt with directly, exposing them to truth and, and a calling. And, and you see the humbling experience that it was. Being exposed to truth should not make us high-minded. It should humble us. And it's, it's, in that, it's in that state of humbleness that God can take that truth and actually begin to do something with it. Because once we think of ourselves as superior, because we know the, we know the truth of the Word of God, then, then what we've done is make ourselves unuseful. Because it's, it's that pride that God will not bless. It's that arrogance that God will not use. And because um, he, as we read earlier, he resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. So there's always, um, with, um, uh, with uh, high-mindedness, there's always this uh, sense of self-elevation, but it, and it, it's the, at the expense of others. And, and that is no way to serve the Lord. And, and of course, you know, if we think about um, the op, if you want to, you know, put down a characteristic that, what would you say would be the opposite of high-mindedness? Humility. I mean, that's, that's the first thing that came to my mind. And I was uh, jotting that down. I said, you know, if, if, if I don't want, if, if I want to re remain not high-minded, I've got to, I've got to humble myself. Humility is, is what uh, we, that's the characteristic that we need to have. We need to be humble. <clears throat> so let's just say, you know, Dave's out there talking about his, his goal that he scored as a goalie because that great, you know, that great uh, save he made and kicked that puck and it went all the way across the ice. It was just an amazing thing. I've never seen anything like it, Dave. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, neither have I because he's never done it. And, and I'm so, <laughs> he's never seen anything like it. So, you know, somebody who's high minded would say, oh, it's nothing. I do that all the time. But somebody who is humble, how would somebody who's humble react to a statement that Dave makes about his ability of scoring a goal as a goalie? Like God, God gave me the wisdom and the yeah. ability. So if, if Dave told me that story, how, how would, how, how would, how, what's the best way I would be to react to that? Good shot. Good shot. Dave, that's a good shot, man. I've never seen anything like that. Yeah, you're really blessed. And Dave's sitting there going, yeah. Because <laughs> he's so humble. No. High-mindedness wants to rob other people of anything. They, 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 they want to take that away from them. Humility is always looking to add to other people. Always wanting to bless them. Always wanting to make sure that, you know, that they have the opportunity to express themselves and not be torn down. Um, you're always looking for the needs. Of, what's that word again? Approval. Yeah, excellent. Man, you're getting that down. Um, I, I want to, one more verse of scripture before we finish tonight. As we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. If you turn there, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. <coughs> and uh, um, if you would, uh, one more verse of scripture. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4. Would you read verse number 6? Seven for us tonight. Verse number seven. First Corinthians four seven. Okay, that's a good question. Now he's talking about spiritual gifts all throughout the book of First Corinthians, and he's talking about abilities and uh, uh, activities in the ministry. Uh, the first couple chapters, he's talking about the division that, that's been taking place in that early church, you know, who baptized who, and, you know, who are you a follower of, that kind of thing. And he's, he's talking about all these things that have been tearing this church apart, okay? And so, so when he's talking about differ, um, he's talking about differ as in the fact that, we're, you know, in the ministry, in, a, in any church, we're all different. We all have different talents and abilities and gifts and, and operations within the church. We're all, we're all involved, but we're all involved in a different format and different ways. Um, you know, and the, and the question has to be is, you know, um, um, is, is, it, is it all right for us to be different? And we talked a little bit about this Thursday night. We talked about how the church is a very diverse church, and it needs to be. We have different gifts and different abilities and different talents and different ministries. And so we talked about all the different backgrounds and that kind of stuff. 
So there is, there is a lot of difference in a church. And you know, the question is asked, who has made us different? So this is, you know, Paul is asking the question to the, the folks there. So who has made us different? God has. If, if there's a difference between Brother Stephen and I, there's, it's because God's made us different. Okay, Brother Stephen, let me just say publicly that you do a wonderful job on Thursday night handling prayer meeting, taking the prayer requests. Okay, you do a gr- you're very patient with people. You listen really well because um, I know, you know, just hearing people, I don't always catch everything. You're really good at doing that and relaying that information again. You do a great job with it. And, and, you know, sometimes people kind of ramble and you are very, you don't sit up there and go, oh, man, everything all good. You know, you don't roll your eyes. or You don't roll your eyes, brother. And, and so you and I are very different in that sense. And you're very patient with people. I probably am not as patient as you are, okay? This is, this is a good thing, all right? Now, you know, um, he, God has blessed him with this wonderful ability and, and because of that, he does a great job taking prayer requests. It's, and it's, it's, you should try it sometime. It's not an easy job, okay? Um, so we're different. Um, you, know, other, you know, Brother Denny has some great building um, talents. He's, he's good at construction and things like that. That's not me, you know? Um, and so you and I are different, and so if, you know, if somebody, if we have a building project going on, I could, I could probably draw it up on a piece of paper. It always works on paper, brother, okay? But it doesn't always work when you put it to practice. So we're different. Uh, there are other people that are better with evangelism. Some people are better at teaching. Some people are wonderful at dealing with people and helping them, and they're very patient other folks are better organizers, and they're really good at putting things together and making it work. There are some folks that are that they would prefer to be behind the scenes. You know, I just want to do whatever I need to do. I don't need to be up front. Um, there are some people that are that excel at being in front of people and, and leading and 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 you know, doing the, the doing the work at, that's up front in order to get things accomplished. So when you think about that, just that. One statement, who has made us different? And, and when we answer that question the, the right way and say God did, then we really get to the, to the heart of what it, the difference between being proud and being humble, of being high-minded and, and being um, you know, someone who is, um, um, is considerate, considerate of others because I would look at them and say, well, listen, that, that they, their ministry or whatever they're involved in is a result of God doing work in their life. I don't, why would I say anything against that? Why would I, why would I you know, accuse them of anything or try to diminish anything or say, well, I can do that better uh, when, I, when I know that it's God that gave them that ability? So he, he, he mentions, that's the first question he asks. Who's made us different? And it goes on from there. And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? Now ye are full, now ye are rich. Ye have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God ye did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. All right. Well, we'll we'll just stop right there. And Paul is going through this long argument concerning the church in Corinth because they're so boastful, and they're always elevating themselves above other people, and they're always tearing each other down, and he just wants to stop that whole thing and say, you know, we're not going to play this game. Um... No, nobody's more superior than anybody else because of position or activity. You, you, you've reigned as kings. In other words, um, what he's talking about is, you know, you have this you know, in a church setting and there's people that are boasting about their ability of running things. 
and, and, and he's just, he's getting, he's getting tired of it. He doesn't elevate himself. I'm an apostle. And I'm not elevating myself just because I'm an apostle. Paul's saying, if I'm an apostle, it's because God made me an apostle. If, he, if I have the skills and, and the talent and the calling, it's because God gave it to me. It has nothing to do with me. And, and, and that is so true in everything that we do in the work of God. If you have any ability in any activity that you do for the work of the ministry, in anything, it's because it was given to you from God. There is that, you get that in your mind, it, it takes away this high-mindedness immediately. There is no pride there. There is no arrogance. There is no self-elevation because it's all of God. So that humble approach, what's that word we got again? Yeah, if you have, if you have that, you're just blowing smoke. You, you're presenting yourself as something that you're not. You're elevating yourself over other people when you shouldn't be. And what that does is it, and you think about it this way, if it's, you know, this idea of blowing smoke, that smoke, what that does is it robs God of glory. And we just, need, we need to get that out of the way. So that high-mindedness, if once it's gone and we have this humble approach, uh, first of all, to God, but also towards other people, what we, what we do is allow God to receive glory as we recognize God's ability of what he's doing, not only in our lives, but what God is doing in other people's lives. Humility needs to be what we're about and certainly not high-mindedness. What's that word? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I just want to thank you, Lord. What a great blessing it is to know that you have done so much in our lives and Father, I just want to thank you that you've given us an opportunity of, of serving together, ministering together, working together as a body of believers. And Lord, that we can, um, that Lord, help us to be mindful of what you are doing in other people's lives. And help us, dear Father, to re remove this really bad thinking concerning ourselves and self and the self elevation and boasting father that we would that it would be excluded from our lives lord help us to be humble help us to see you working in, in other people's lives and and that we would give you the glory for what you're able to accomplish now we, we just want to thank you dear father and pray lord that you'd help us uh, to pattern ourselves against the godly characteristics that we see in the scriptures and avoid these, these traps that, we, that we're presented with in this chapter. And Father, I just want to thank you for your wonderful grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand, please. Thank you, Anderson. You did a great job.